uh, I'm going to lead off and then turn it over to Stan and then to uh, um, my uh, my talk is about uh, HIFU, uh, um, uh, high intensity focused ultrasound. I'm sure all of, all of us, when we were kids, we, we'd get a magnifying glass and we'd get the sun's rays and some tissue paper and we'd hold the glass up and get those light, that light to focus on a particular point on the paper and uh, if we were successful, the paper would ignite. Well, that's really what's happening here, only instead of using light, they're using sound. And a somewhat similar principle in the sense that it's focused and focused on the, uh, on the uh, tumor within the, uh, <clears throat> within the uh, prostate gland. Um, the, the challenge, of course, is, is, uh, is doing it uh, so that you, you focus the light or beg your pardon, focus the sound on the tumor. And that's, uh, and that's of course, done because the, uh, this is all done under MRI, where the doctors can actually uh, um, see what's happening in real time. Um, the MRI guides it increases the precision and uh, minimizes the incontinence and erectile dysfunction and bowel problems that might otherwise, otherwise occur. Um, if the, the, one of the criticisms uh, that was uh, suggested was that if the prostate cancer is multifocal, in other words, if it's uh, uh, a number of smaller uh, prostate cancer tumors within the gland, then it becomes difficult to, uh, to treat it. And uh, Mark uh, Gonzalago at University of Miami has uh, uh, done much to, uh, to uh, say that the HIFU is not really the best uh, process that, uh, that we have if the uh, prostate cancer is multifocal as opposed to uh, one lesion. Some of the pros for is that it's a non some of the pros for HIFU is that it's non-invasive, the surrounding tissue is not damaged, although uh, usually I think should go in front of that. And some of the cons are that there's a possible incontinence, which suggests that there may be damage to surrounding tissue. There's possible scarring, changes to erectile function, blood in the urine, and limited information as, uh, as it's a newer form of treatment. My current information is that this has not been uh, approved by the FDA in the United States, and I don't know if it's available in Canada. To my knowledge, it, uh, it isn't as yet. It is in Toronto? Yeah, Toronto? Okay, all right. Thank you, Ron. One of the other points that uh, uh, Emberton uh, did, uh, did mention is that uh, MRI prior to biopsies are, are particularly useful. And, um, and if you do a 12-core random, uh, you detect biopsies almost half the time. And uh, if you uh, rule out cancer with a 12-core, you do it about 75% of the time. With a multi-parametric MRI, uh, you can uh, detect prostate cancer about 93% and rule it out 89% of, of the time. So the, the point being is that MRIs are really invaluable to, to guiding biopsies. Treatment success. Uh, HIFU for full gland or even multifocal is, uh, is uh, 83%, both of them being the same, and uh, radical prostatectomy robotic is generally done now is 80%, radiation 81%. What about erectile dysfunction? With HIFU it comes in at 11 and full gland at 24, whereas with radical prostatectomy, of course, and radiation it's much higher. And the same is true for incontinence. Uh, with HIFU, it's, uh, it's minimal to non-existent if it's uh, on the focal gland and, uh, and radical prostatectomy, it comes in at 18.3 and radiation at 9.4. What I want to show you is uh, another one that uh, uh, Emberton, Mark Emberton, uh, that we, uh, we listened to is, uh, is talking about, and that's... Uh, uh, one by Profound Medical, and uh, Kelly and I had a chance to meet 
uh, Steve Plymail, who's the head of this organization, and he's got a, a uh, a thing called TULSA, transurethral ultrasound ablation. So it's because it's similar uh, to uh, to the HIFU in in the sense that it's using ultrasound. I thought uh, I'd show you this, which is a, a slightly different uh, uh, process. Now, if I can get this to there we go. <clears throat> It uses MRI just like the other one and I draw your attention to the upper left where the time is shown and then the pictures along the bottom which are the MRI. So it emits, uh, the wand emits ultrasound and as you can see by the color photograph there, it's destroying that tissue around the urethra. The urethra shows up in blue because it's, uh, it's flooded with a coolant to prevent damage to the urethra. And the tolerance, because they're doing this under MRI, the tolerance that they can get is 1.3 millimeters. In other words, they can go to within 1.3 millimeters of the edge of the, uh, of the urethra. I think the time on that one was just over 30 minutes and uh, the whole procedure takes about uh, takes about uh, uh, about 40 minutes from, uh, from beginning to end. Um, it's done on an outpatient basis and the individual goes home after, uh, probably after some time of, uh, of, uh, of rest to make sure everything's fine. Um, I spoke to uh, Steve uh, a little while ago and asked him and said, uh, well, when we met with him, we asked him, when is this going to be available in Calgary? And he said, it should be this sometime this past fall. Well, that hasn't happened, obviously. And uh, um, what he did say, though, is that uh, he's waiting for uh, uh, Health Canada approval, that it's, uh, it's gone through a number of tests in Europe and been very successful there in terms of the side effects of incontinence or uh, or erectile dysfunction. And so he's hopeful that it should be here by either spring or early summer. And uh, so that's a, uh, another possibility. That's all I had to say. And uh, what I'm going to do now is turn it over to Stan and then uh, he can uh, go through his slides. Okay, good evening. I'm so happy to see so many people here tonight. Uh, my name is Stan Knowlton and um, one of the things that uh, you know really stuck out at this conference was uh, the humor and attitude that people have, and uh, you know how uh, Im uh, important it is to always maintain a positive attitude. Now, um, I'm, I feel like I'm one of the lucky people. Uh, you know, since my treatment, um, my uh, PSA has remained relatively undetectable, and my uh, testosterone you know, has come up to about 18 and sort of leveled off. So I feel like I'm um, doing quite well. And, uh, you know, I've never felt better. It's one of those things where, you know, this year, you know, I made a resolution that I'm going to do something, uh, you know, that I've never done before or never even would consider. And I believe that every prostate journey, you know, should begin and end with... Um, you know, a comfortable activity. So what I have here is something that we might recognize. And um, back when I was younger, these uh, things were made out of steel and hard plastic. But today, if you look at them, they're made out of something that's uh, almost like a space age type of a gel. So I'll just pass that around. You can take a look at that. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, I'm going to get to use that apparatus sometime this year. Now, one of the things with, uh, uh, you know, prostate cancer is that, you know, people always want to know what is your silver bullet that you're using to beat this, uh, this condition. And, um, you know, they're asking somebody that can't even remember where he put his keys. So, you know, I always have to try and write things down and, you know, uh, you know keep, keep idea of, uh, you know, where things are. So, um, but one of the most, um, you know, disturbing things I've run into is that, even my pharmacist wants to know my secret, you know, as he's handing me my medication. And, you know, that feels a little scary because, you know, all he has to do is look in a bag, it might be in there. Uh, the, uh, 
you know, when you, we all remember when we first started out, um, you know, trying to figure out what it is that we're going to do. Well, myself, you know, after a little while, ended up in a hospital meeting room, and, uh, you know, 45 minutes, somebody uh, was in there, a representative, and they just rattled off all this medical jargon, and they said, are you, do you understand the sign here? You know, which I did, you know, but what I heard was, you know, I heard something about a muffler or something about a television and, uh, you know, something about that I'd be having sex within a week, you know, so I, I signed and, you know, forgot about that. Now, shortly after the operation, I woke up and, you know, I was sort of horrified to find that I had become attached to the hospital infrastructure. And, uh, you know, you can always tell how long uh, prostate cancer's been around by looking at the equipment that they still have. You know, so I, I asked the attendant in there, you know, how long this was gonna be around. And um, you know, I told him I was ready to go. And he said, no, it's gotta stay in for a month. And I, I said, you're joking. I told him, you don't understand. I'm gonna be having sex in a week. <laughs> and uh, you know, so what, uh, you know, what, what lady, you know, is going to, uh, you know, be aroused by some Greek god standing there you know, with a garden hose hanging off the faucet. So when I uh, you looked at this thing here, you know, I eventually got home, and while I was at home living, you know, sitting in the living room, you know, I was trying to switch the bags over. Uh, you know, all of a sudden I realized somehow I got the hose disconnected. And uh, so I had a big bag in one hand, a little bag in the other hand, you know, and I'm racing to the washroom, uh, you know, trying to figure out what, what's going on. Now normally, when I run out of hands, I use my teeth. But in this situation, I wasn't too sure if I should do that. So once I got there, I wasn't too sure if I should put this stuff in the toilet or else, you know, keep it sterile and put it into the, into the bathtub. You know, but I guess I made the right decision at the time. But after about two hours washing the floor, you know, I started to realize that the, the bag wasn't filling up anymore. And uh, my bladder started to sort of tighten up. And that's when I knew I made the right decision. So I ended up at the emergency, and while I was over there, uh, you know, there's a lady comes walking in, one of the nurses, she's got this shrins about this long, half full of liquid, and I thought she was gonna put it in there and, you know, suck the obstruction out of this thing. But to my um, surprise, you know, she pushed it in. So that really got my attention, and it also got the attention of the drunk that was in the next gurney, you know, he saw this, he jumped up and ran out. And he's, he's the one that's got the object sticking out of his chest. So this must have been a little bit, you know, um, beyond what he could handle. Now, the, um, one of the things with, um, you know, with these, these apparatuses here is that, um, you know, when you have these obstructions, you know, you always look around and I have something here. Like you could go down to any hardware store and pick up something that looks like this. You know, the, um, the engineering that went into this little piece here, you know, far uh, exceeds, you know, what that, uh, you know, that contraption that I was using. So, so at that point, I decided to put, to put a kit together and see if I could, um, you know, uh, get some attention of some people uh, so we can uh, distribute it to more survivors and, you know, make life just a little bit easier. Uh, the um, conference we went to focused on, um, you know, the mature, healthy, vigorous survivors. Uh, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, they were talking about was that, you know, what, you know, we should be not looking so much at the body counts, but, you know, trying to figure out what do we do right. Now, the, um, we, you know, we all hope for the magic drugs, uh, the cures and the, um, the treatments and, you know, so many other uh, side, treating the side effects, you know, are also, um, you know, right up front. But there are a lot of things, you know, that we can also do. Uh, so, you know, I was actually quite surprised that, uh, you know, in the land of milk and honey, they fundraise for prostate cancer. And I was thinking, wow, you know, I thought I was going to go down there and there was going to be all kinds of people, but they're just like us. So, prostate cancer really doesn't discriminate. It's, it's everywhere. Now, one of my heroes over here, uh, you know, he uh, was down there, uh, has a dementia, is trying to, starting to set in, sort of like mine, but I think um, 
you know, I'm doing a little bit better because he keeps referring to himself as Ed, Ed Asner. <laughs> the, the, one of the things I, I also noticed was, the, you know, where the funding goes, you know, a lot of it goes to the upper parts rather than down to, you know, what survivors can uh, participate in. We also get into times where, you know, we've got professional conflicts. Now, this one here is, um, uh, you know, looking at uh, when I first went for, uh, you know, my 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 treatments and you know trying to figure out what I was doing. Uh, you know, they told me a biopsy was going to be something that had three or four samples. Well, to my horror, you know, I had uh, 18 or 19 samples, and uh, you know, I call that an autopsy. So. <laughs> One of the things I was glad is I had one of these in my trunk, you know, so that's uh, included as part of the kit. So one of the things that, it, uh, you know, we eventually did was that, um, you know, we went with the radiation and, you know, it was, at uh, first nine was okay. Uh, 19, well, not too bad. Uh, well, then you hit 28 and that was, uh, that was it. I couldn't handle anymore. You know, I said, well, we've got some new medication for you. So I said, okay. And when I got home, I looked at medication and said, for veterinary use only. So I decided to keep going. Now, when you look at the uh, inside, you find that, uh, you know, a lot of the tissues are actually quite healthy. And if you take a look from the outside, oh, there we go, coal and fired steam boiler. Uh, so perspective is everything. You know, from the inside, it's called medical imaging. From the outside, I think we refer to it as porn. So, so anyway, when we, uh, you know, look at uh, the radiation and the effects of, you know, what they used, when I was down at a conference, they said, well, you could have actually used space ore. And I said, ore what? And they said, space ore. So if you look at it, it's something that's, in, in, uh, you know, inserted between the uh, prostate and the, um, the other area to avoid the uh, toxicity. Now, when we look at, um, you know, how well did they burn it? Well, this one here, um, most people say it was around about a medium. But if you look carefully, you can see soot. So I think it was, you know, well done. But not only did they burn the uh, prostate and everything in there, but they also burnt my uh, pancreas. And, um, you know, it's, uh, my, my effects with diabetes were immediate. And, you know, once that happened, uh, you know, you got incontinence with diabetes, and uh, you know, that's when you go visit your girlfriend, and um, you know, it's that way you avoid peeing in your bed. So, what happens is that um, one of the good things with this is they put you on Crestor, they put you on metformin, you know, along with the insulin. And, um, you know, so to my surprise, uh, you know, I think maybe I have, might have, uh, you know, um, walked right down where. Um, you know, Snuffy was talking about, because right now I'm still on uh, metformin, and you know I'm I'm feeling really good. Uh, the Crestor almost killed me, and uh, my pancreas for some reason kicked back in, and uh, I'm no longer on uh, insulin anymore. And uh, but I have to sort of cut back on the metformin, or my uh, glucose levels will crash. Now the um, one of the other things we looked at was testosterone. Um, you know, and the miracle drugs that deal with it. Uh, well, if we look at the, um, you know, in our mind, we always think we could handle this hot flash, and you got this male perspective of what it is. You get down there and you find that, well, the physical things are taken care of, the emotional and psychological and spiritual part of it is something that hasn't really been too well understood. And, uh, you know, when we ask, uh, why is sex important? Well, I'm, I'm still quite young. And, you know, I was uh, very active, uh, at least I think I was. And, um, but if you look over to here, you see that uh, medical science does not have enough data. And I was thinking, enough data? Well, I could give them data, you know. So first couple weeks, first couple days after the treatment, you know, I was dancing around and prancing around the room like uh, Celine Dion. And a couple days later, I looked more like my um, Aunt Mabel after she shaves. So this is, uh, you know, what I had gone through, you know, going from puberty, uh, uh, female puberty to menopause. And then as I started to come back to male, you know, I have returned to uh, what, what I would refer to as the male uh, puberty again, second puberty, but without the plumbing. 
So, you know, the doctors say, don't worry about it. The body will absorb it. Okay, so the, um, you know, when we look at um, some of the treatments for that, at this point, it's not about sexuality. It's about circulation. You know, you're trying to maintain what you have. And um, so part of the kit here, you know, includes something that, um, oh, where is it? Right here. Oh, it's, yeah, there it is. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I, part of the kit includes something that you would put on here. It's got a pump at the other end. And, you know, you're trying to maintain what's, what little you have left. Like before surgery, you know, I probably could fill this thing up, but after surgery, the lips are pointing the wrong way. It has to go like this. So it has to be modified. It kind of looks like my aunt, Mabel, without her dentures. And um, so when we look at these things here, you know, you, there is a lot that we have to still learn. And, uh, you know, being at the age I am, you know, I, when they removed my prostate, they removed uh, the memory chip of all my sexuality. And then they also uh, removed, um, you know, a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of other things that are very important as to who I am. Um, you know, and in a process that, um, you know, you have to think about what you're going to do. So, uh, you know, I really have no intention of ever riding a bike. Okay, so I would like to, um, I would like to thank the Calgary Support Group, you know, for giving me this opportunity to go down and to learn, you know, a little bit more about my condition with everybody else's. So thanks for having me up here. Okay, thank you, Stan. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to just add what Stan said. Thank, thank the, uh, this group for supporting us to go down. Uh, one of the uh, requests was to give a kind of an overview of the conference. So perhaps going last is not such a bad idea because mine is really an overview and a few things I observed. Um, it's a wonderfully uh, it's a wonderful conference. It's, it's, it's very well um, laid out. It's, uh, uh, the presentations are absolutely superb. There are three components. There's an exhibit hall where, and there's, a, uh, uh, there's an area where there are breakout sessions and then, the gen and then the general session where speakers make their presentations. The exhibitors are generally provide the medical professions with procedures, pharmaceuticals or wellness support services and information on how to, to pick the best treatment is mostly the same as offered in Alberta. Uh, I happened to pick up one particular brochure that I, I liked you know, um, and, it, and, and it talks about low risk prostate cancer, intermediate risk disease, all the things that we hear about here um, and it talks about intermediate risk disease is a comp complicated because there are so many options which we uh, likely all know about. And again, quality of life is often the most important issue. Uh, decisions about treatments are based on the risk of side effects, not the misguided idea that one type of treatment cures cancer better. There are mul multiple local treatment op options, surgery, seed implants, radiation, cryotherapy, and variable side effects uh, accommodate this. And there is one s systemic option called testosterone inactivating pharmaceuticals, which they call TIP. I hadn't actually heard about this one before. Um, I'm sure Stuart has, but anyway. Um, and it's local, local treatments ablate the prostate, and that, but a TIP affects the whole body and testosterone blockade for nine to 12 months result in a negative biopsy 80% of the time. And men with positive biopsy are generally given local treatment. And after TIP, men are monitored as if they are on active surveillance. Approximately 50% of men will need retreatment with TIP or local therapy within five years. So there's always little things that you hear about that you perhaps haven't heard about before. There 
was an exhibitor showing or promoting the CyberKnife system. And the CyberKnife system is an image-guided linear accelerator mounted on a robotic arm that is designed to deliver a very precise type of external radiation treatment known as stereotactic body radiation therapy. It is the only radiation therapy technology that automatically tracks tumor motion and adjusts the treatment beam as natural prostate motion is detected. And as a result, the radiation is targeted to the prostate, minimize exposure of healthy tissue. So using the CyberKnife system, physicians can precisely maximize dose in four to five treatment sessions, minimize side effects, and maximize patient comfort during treatment. And there's a big brochure on this with a lot more information. And if anybody's interested, I have that. There was, I was particularly interested in the, the, different, the, the more advanced PET scans that were being made available in the States. There's uh, the carbon-11 acetate PET CT imaging for prostate cancer. This is one that is uh, being um, promoted uh, by a company in Phoenix called Phoenix Molecular Imaging. Uh, they had a booth and they made a presentation. And it, uh, it, I won't say it competes with the C11F18 coline one that the Mayo Clinic uses, but they are in competition with each other. <laughs> and uh, they are still going through sort of clinical trials, I suppose you would say, to get this approved. Um, and you can get it um, in Phoenix, and it's subsidized, so it would cost you three to four thousand U.S. dollars. Um, and they do say that the overall detection rate for cancer recurrence or metastatic disease with the C11 acetate is 88 percent, to which compares to 74 percent for the C11 coline. Um, lesions detected at lower PSA levels than the uh, coline and therefore treatment decisions could perhaps be made uh, earlier. I don't see a lot of difference between the two except the cost and um, they also when I inquired if it would help me they said no you have to have a PSA that is actually rising, not static. Uh, I didn't go into any real long, decision, long discussions with them as to why that was such, um, but uh, took it at face value for now. In the breakout sessions, that included support groups, and there were quite a number of support groups, or ask the experts. Uh, one support group discussed the use of Provence. And there's mixed response in, the, in, in actually the support group. Um, Provence is an immunotherapy option, uh, which was also having a breakfast presentation later in the weekend. And Provence is a, an, an immunotherapy that is designed to reprogram your body's immune cells to attack advanced prostate cancer cells by jump-starting immune cells already in your body. Provange thereby helps you personalize your fight against prostate cancer. And, uh, but it, it, based, it requires blood being removed and then three days later given back to you six times. And it's costly for Canadians. It is covered for US patients with medical insurance. And I say costly, it's uh, up to like 90,000 US. And then you have to find somewhere to have the blood taken out and put back. So it is extremely cost costly. And when I listened to what was being presented at the support groups and even discussed and questions raised at the breakfast session, 
uh, I thought that the life expectancy benefits were not well established and the possible side effects included a significant impact to one's lifestyle. So then we talk, come and in, really enjoyed some of the session speakers. I was very impressed with the banter between Mark, Mark Moyard and Mark Schultz. They are true professionals. They maintained an upbeat mood throughout the conference. They d demonstrated real professionalism on how to discuss a rather sad subject with humor, hope, yet keeping focused on the subject being presented. Mark Emberton, who David really talked about, he was a guest speaker from UK London University College Hospital, and he was talking about a program exploring the role of focal therapy using high intensity focused ultrasound, HIFU, which David talked about. It was an incredibly impressive presentation. Mark Emberton knows his stuff. Oh my goodness. He, uh, he could talk about any particular subject, I think, that uh, dealt with prostate cancer. Um, Obviously, David mentioned that it uses sound waves, heats, heat and destroy small areas of tissue in the prostate, MRI before and after. What, what made his presentation rather amusing to me was that patients stay at the Ritz Hotel in London. Um, for about, about seven days, they throw in an MRI, it costs you 10,000 US. A little more if both MRIs are in UK. Um, and... Uh, he, he, he thought that people would enjoy the extra stay. <laughs> it's a nice substitute for the 12-core random biopsy. However, as David mentioned, there are side effects. And I was also intrigued, perhaps saddened in some way, to see that in the uh, January uh, Digital Examiner, there's a, there's a long, a big article on HIFU for prostate cancer and think twice. So I'm not going to refer to that, but obviously if one was thinking about this, one would have to have a, uh, have a look at it to see if this is in fact something that, that uh, is right for you. Uh, as a little side to that, I happened to watch the BBC World News on December the 19th and there was an interview with Mark Emberton. I thought, oh, I recognize that chap and speaking so well. And he's suggesting that they have uh, found a new laser treatment uh, that they had performed in a trial with 500 patients, patients that had truly transformative results in the treatment of prostate cancer. There's absolutely no details given, but I'm sure we're going to hear about that and just exactly what, uh, what he's found and, and how he thinks it might help some people. Eugene Kwan from the Mayo Clinic, he uses the and promotes the uh, C11 Coline PET CT. That's been around a little longer than the other one I mentioned. Um, he, he, um, he continues to promote early timely detection. He supports empowerment with the patient. He's not supportive of vaccine type, vaccine type processes like Provenge and he supports spot radiation treatments. Um, I, I found his presentation very similar to what he's presented in the past. I didn't think there was anything new coming from him, but he's, he's known well, and uh, for anyone who hadn't listened to him before, I'm sure it was, it was interesting. Nicholas uh, Vod. Jalan Zhang, may have pronounced that wrong. He's a medical oncologist from the Cancer Center of Nevada. He supports radium-223, which many of us know is a six injection process. He talks about it after chemo, but it can be considered in series with other drugs, including chemo. And I later found out that at the conference, in fact, from one of the other speakers that radium-223 can destroy bone marrow. So I guess that's something to consider as well. He also mentioned that his research on Provenge found the process only hits on one of the targets and only slightly extends life expectancy. So if you're going to spend $100,000 with side effects and only get 
a slight extension to life expectancy, I think you've got to think twice about it. He talked about drugs undergoing phase three clinical trials, although he didn't present any, anything except by reference. And these numbers or these drugs, I'm afraid I don't mean very much to me, but we may have some chemists in the room, so I'm gonna sort of mention them. He said his opinion is ARN 509, it's a pill, he said we'll make it, ODM 201, an androgen blocker will likely make it. Ola parib, parib, which is limb parza, after generic testing from blood, and will require generic patient knowledge. And prostvac VF, which is immune therapy, there's a long wait for approval. Then we got on to Charles Myers. He talked about metformin right from the very beginning. He said it's very important to be considered during hormone therapy. Reduces the loss of the PTEN gene that supports prostate cancer. Metformin used to treat diabetes. It does have side effects that need to be monitored. And when I came back and spoke to uh, my oncologist here, um, basically said that uh, the results and side effects need much more um, time and more clinical trials. And it is not currently being prescribed for use with either Eligard or Extendi. Henry Yampolsky was a radiation oncologist presented some cautious remarks regarding treatments being promoted by other speakers. Radium-223 reduces the marrow mass in bones, which I've mentioned, may impact chemo options, something to be considered when sequencing with other treatments. Target radiation of tumors does not guarantee completely being radiated, and other spots may show up, location may have risks. And then on Sunday, I had some thoughts from Sunday's general reviews. It's not clear with low number of cancer legions, two to four, any benefit to start chemo concurrently with other treatments. Every patient has a very different makeup of prostate cancer tumors. Early detection and combination of treatments changing the game. Moyage three rules regarding pills, one, the objective rule, can it be measured? Two, the subjective test, how do you feel? And three, is there a lifestyle change to get off this pill? No magical diet that cures prostate cancer. Be happy, live as well as possible, and strive for good blood test results. Magnesium citrate supplements and flaxseed may lower cholesterol and reduce hot flushes. Take ginger to help symptoms during chemo. And I guess my final thought of the three-day weekend was that cost and insurance coverage in US seems to be linked in how some treatments are being promoted and discussed. Higher the cost, someone other than the patient is benefiting or not benefiting. It's, it's, it's an interesting, it's a well worth conference to attend but I think you have to think about what treatment is best for you and how it might impact your lifestyle and balance the two together. Thank you very much.